Okay. Okay, let me encourage you to take a seat. Good, let me say good morning. It's good to see you. And if you're watching at home, I know Colin is. If anyone else is watching alongside Colin, we hope you feel part of our service this morning. It is good to come and to worship the Lord together. And we're going to start with this song, uh, Bless the Lord, O My Soul. And a great song gives us a, a reminder of all his goodness to us. So after the introduction, we're going to stand and sing, Bless the Lord, O My Soul. All that uh, within me worship his holy name. Please be seated. Thank you. Psalm 103 is what that hymn is based on. So it might be nice just to follow up the musical version with the original, the written version. And uh, let's alternate. I'll read a verse, you read read a verse. Let's uh, read Psalm 103 together. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my innermost being praise his holy name. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all 
He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. Well, you have to pause there, don't you? If he did, we wouldn't be here this morning. But because he does not treat us as our sins deserve, we're welcome into his presence. And we come with confidence and with boldness in and through the person and the work of Jesus Christ. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly host, you who you his servants who do his will. Amen. Amen. We join not just with Christians all around the world this morning to worship the Lord, but with a heavenly host as well. So let's do that. Let's link our hearts, our minds together in prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Loving God, thank you that from everlasting to everlasting is the Lord. You are uncreated. You depend upon no one. You are the self-existing God. You've always been there, you always will be there. No terrorist, no army, no uh, dictator will ever dethrone you and take your position. You are the God who reigns in the heavens. And Lord, we thank you that we come to one who is unique and special. Lord, you are unique in your character. You are the holy God. When we look within our hearts and our minds, even this morning, even this past couple of days, we are embarrassed or ashamed of some of the thoughts that we have had, maybe some of the deeds we have done. But Lord, as for you, you are perfect, holy in all your ways. But Lord, you don't treat us as our sins deserve. Thank you that you're a God who has compassion upon us as a father has compassion on their children. So Lord, you have compassion upon us. You're a God who wants to forgive us a God who wants to cleanse us, a God who wants to change us, a God who wants to empower us so that we don't keep on making those same mistakes day after day after day. Lord, thank you that you have compassion upon us. Thank you that you are slow to anger. And thank you, Lord, that you are rich in love. Lord, thank you that you're a God who deals with us in love. And Lord, we, we know as we look at the cross, we see the full extent of your love. This is love, not that we loved you. When we couldn't care less about you, you still loved us. And you sent your one and only son to be that sacrifice, that atoning sacrifice for our sins. Lord, we thank you that we have forgiveness in and through the person of Jesus Christ. So we ask that he will be uplifted in our service. We ask that all that's said and done today will be to his honour and glory. So we thank you, Lord, that we can unite our voices and from our very souls declare your praise. And uh, we pray, Lord, for absent friends, you know, those who are not here for a whole variety of reasons, we commit them to you, especially those struggling with health. May they know your presence at this time, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Abby, this is your moment. Good morning. Um, so we're collecting items for a Samaritan's Purse Operation Christmas Child. And I'm Abigail, and I'm the one who's organizing that um, this year. So over the year, we've been collecting various items. So in January and February, we collected hats, scarves, gloves, and mittens. And throughout March and April, we've been collecting hygiene items. And so I'm going to bring you up to date with how many we collected over the last couple of months. So we collected 38 soap, 31 flannels, 21 sponges, 53 toothbrushes, 6 hairbrushes, and 62 combs. So thank you to everyone who contributed to that, and that's a good start to our numbers. So this month, and in May and June, we're going to be collecting cuddly toys. So there's a few examples of different sorts you can get up there, but again, it doesn't really matter what sort it is. Um, it does need to fit in a shoe box, so don't get one too big. But again, the small ones don't really fill up much space, so um, a good sort of size for a shoe box would be great. Um, they do need to be in good condition, so if you, if you want to get them in charity shops, that's fine, but if they can be clean and nice, that would be great. <coughs> or you can hand make them as well, if that's your sort of thing. So. And you can put them in their green box box when you collect them and I'll update you next month. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Right, um, at our all-age service, I try and do something for all ages. We don't all succeed, but we want to do something for the little ones and you have got ten fingers. Let me see. Hold those hands up if you're a child. You see those hands? I want to see those fingers wiggling. Oh, he's not going to do it. Okay, hands down. I've got some items. Uh, and you've just got to talk to the person next to you. You can do it in one, twos, not in ones. Talk to yourself. But you, want. you might want a Nathan, okay? So you can talk to the person next to you. You can swivel around, Alan. Talk to the people behind you. And I just want you to come up with ten items. One for each finger, if you can. So, I'm going to put, for example... Cereals, Rice Krispies is one. Can you think of another nine? But you've got to do it in about 20 seconds, okay? So talk to the person next to you. Go. Say how many you get. Can you get 10 in 20 seconds? Come on, Al. You're thinking cornflakes. Ready, Brett? Come on, you can do it. Chat to Abby behind you if you want. Let me know if you get all 10 quickly. Oh, we got 10 over there. Well done. First to 10 is, is good, but if you can get to 10, that's good. Okay, stop there. Kathy got in there straight away. Um, can you remember any of the ones? You don't have to get all 10. Remember any of the ones you said? We've had that. Fruit Loops. Golden Nugget. Golden Nugget. I love sugar puffs, I haven't done them for years. Yeah, serious. Do you know, when we went to Bulgaria on holiday years ago, we went to a little place called Sazopol. And in Sazopol, I took uh, Kathy and Arlo to a, a little shop. And when we went in the shop, I said to them, have a look, what can you see? And they said, well, it boxes of cereal, Dad. I said, yeah, but what can you see? Cereals, Dad. I said, notice they've only got a choice of three. Whereas in Tesco's, you've got a whole aisle full of cereal boxes. And then they had a cereal box and a gap. Cereal box and a gap. They hadn't got enough even to fill a whole shelf. They had to space them out to make the shelf look full. So in our wealthy country, we got cereal box galore. So much choice. But in some countries, they don't. Okay, ten fingers. Ten fruits. Who's going to come up with ten fruits first of all? One for each. Keep asking. Go, 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 go. Ten fruits. You reckon you got it already? Oh, wow, fast over here. Oh, we got 10 there, but these beat you, these beat you. Naomi, come on, reel them off quickly if you can. Well, I'm impressed, I'm impressed. 
Um, okay, how about this one? Ten chocolate bars, different chocolate bars. Mr. F will be good on this. Ten different chocolate bars. <laughs> the best one ever. Oh, over there they've got them. Okay, oh, not bad, but we got them over there. Did you get some down here, Joe? What was your favourite chocolate bar? I did hear my. I did hear the curly whirly, which is always impressive. Always impressive. Okay, a couple more to go. First one to ten. Ten types of nuts. Brazil nuts, my favourite. Ten types of nuts. And you can't have Martin Fielder, Scott Bundy. Okay, I want these type of nuts. <laughs> oh, we got ten types of nuts over there. Give me a few, Penny. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Okay. Flavours of crisps. Flavours of crisps. Go. Ten, ten, ten. Go, go, go. What's your favourite, Al? Anybody got ten? Oh, Naomi's got ten. Okay, of course, the, 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 the best flavour by far is cheese and onion, and the worst flavour by far is salt and vinegar. They always get left in our packets if we buy a multi-pack. And you can even bizarre, buy bizarre flavours like hedgehog flavoured crisps, believe it or not. Not that I'm recommending them. All right, last, oh, last one. Last one. Ten types of bread. So you can have brown bread, you can have pita bread, you can... Ten types of bread. Go, go, go. Oh, we've we got it over here. Okay, Abby, can you call out a few? <laughs> oh, there's a lot of types of bread there. I wanted a bit more variety, like poppadam or... or um, but, but, no, not poppadam, uh, chapati or uh, naan bread. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, good going. It's not a criticism. I'm just adding to your list. Okay, thank you. You're probably wondering why I'm asking this. In our reading today, the very last reading says this. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Just give me my daily bread. I don't want to have riches that I, I've got life comfortable, that I don't need God. I just can put God to one side because everything I've got I can buy or I need. And I don't want to be poor where I'm hungry and, and, and life is tough and, and I blame God because I don't like the deal I've been dealt. Just give me my debt. Just give me what I need and I'll be content. And one of the things that's missing in our world is contentment. Contentment. And the Bible says godliness and contentment equals great joy. Godliness, getting right with God, Appreciating what you've got brings great joy. It brings contentment. And that's what's desperately missing. So may we all find contentment this day. All right then, what we got next? Oh, our Bible reading. We're in the book of Proverbs. We're going through a little series on Proverbs. And we've got to a stage where we're going through themes. And so we've got some selected verses that will be on the screen. All to do with wealth and poverty. Wealth and poverty. So let me read them to you. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands brings wealth. Then the next verse. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city, but poverty is the ruin of the poor. The blessing of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil for it. A person's riches may ransom their life. But the poor cannot respond to threatening rebukes. 
The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it a wall too high to scale. The poor plead for mercy, but the rich answer harshly. Wealth attracts many friends, but even the closest friend of the poor person deserts them. A fortune made by, li by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapour and a deadly snare. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may, I may become poor and steal and so dishonour the name of my God. Nine verses we're going to look at later on and all to do with that theme of wealth and poverty. So may God give us insight into his word. Before we do that, we're going to sing a couple of songs and then the youngsters are going off to explore us. So we're going to sing the splendor of the king and then great is the Lord. Shall we stand to sing? remain standing and we'll keep on that theme great is the Lord and most worthy our praise and this great God wants to be at work in our lives incredible
Please be seated. Okay, explorers, you're off to explore upstairs with Catherine. We'll see you later. Good, let's pray again, shall we? Lord, thank you that we can come into your presence and we bring our petitions, our requests and our thanksgiving. We pray for the world in which we live. We think of this uh, ongoing situation in Palestine between Jew and Palestinian and um, humanly, Lord, there is no simplistic answer but we long that uh, a measure of peace and stability will come back to that part of the world. So we pray for that situation we pray especially for the peace of Jerusalem And we pray especially for world leaders as they seek to bring um, a solution to that area of the Middle East. We think of the ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And uh, likewise, Lord, we pray for all involved, humble, Lord, stubborn and proud hearts. Remove people of influence who are evil from power and bring to prominence those who are peacemakers. Bless the peacemakers, we ask. And there are many conflicts, Lord, around the world that have been going on for many years that don't grab the headlines. And so many people are displaced and face hunger. And, uh, and uh, as a result of that disease, just because of man's wickedness. Lord, there's so much to depress us and um, sadden our hearts. And yet there's so much good in the world as well. So much to uplift our spirits and, and thrill us. Thank you, Lord, for... Uh, th- this day, the sun shining, which always makes us feel better, the opportunity to enjoy each other's company. We thank you for the liberty, the freedom we have to meet like this without fear of arrest. Thank you that we have your word in English, uh, in the language of our, our own tongue, and we can read it and meditate upon it. And uh, Lord, you have blessed us in so many ways. Thank you for these tremendous songs that lift our spirits and help us in our appreciation of who you are. And we pray for ourselves now and for the little ones upstairs as we look into your word. Lord, make it live, we pray. Uh, Make it uh, applicable so that we can uh, not just have a a lesson, uh, a lecture this morning. We want you to speak into our hearts. So, Lord, um, there we pray. Put your finger on those particular verses or points that you want uh, each one of us individually to understand as well as collectively. So bless your word to us. Uh, in this building we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our title is Wealth and Poverty, and we've got a selective number of verses from the book of Proverbs that pick up on that theme, Wealth and Poverty. I like what Earl Wilson said, Earl Wilson. He said, there ought to be a better way of starting the day than having to get up. There ought to be a better way to start in the day than having to get up. It reminds me of the story of the teenage boy who wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. And his mother tried everything. She tried the shouting, the threatening, uh, all sorts. So in the end, she decided to reason with her son. She sat on the edge of his bed and she said, let me tell you the story of the two birds. One bird got up early in the morning and there was lots of worms and lots of insects and he had a feast. He could feed himself and his family. The second bird got up late. And when he got up, all the worms and all the bugs had gone. Now, what does that teach you? What does that tell you? The little boy thought for a minute and said, uh, tells me that bugs that wake up early in the morning get eaten. <laughs> that sometimes you can interpret something totally different to somebody else. But we know the expression, don't we? The early bird gets the worm. Just like the one who arrives first at a buffet gets first pickings. That's the joy of being early. And that expression, the early bird, is universal. If you travel around from different countries, you often see in restaurants an early bird deal. If you get in there early, you get cheaper prices. Whereas if you come at peak time, you have to pay more expensive prices. So restaurants sometimes know the principle of the early bird. But if you want 
the pickings. If you want the riches, you have to get out of bed and earn them. And the book of Proverbs over the last couple of weeks has reminded us that laziness doesn't add to anybody's character. God does not like lazy people. And if you want to become wealthy rather than poor, one of the things we have to do is get up in the morning and do some work. It doesn't guarantee wealth, but it's a good way of getting from poverty to wealth. Now we've got nine verses, and that gives me about two minutes on each verse, so we better get going. Here's the first one. Chapter 10, verse 4 says, Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. So proverb number one, or example number one, has to do with those hands. And the principle here is straightforward, it's common sense. Lazy or busy. If you are lazy, you don't do work, you're not going to earn any money. You'll stay poor. But if you put your hands to work, even as an odd job man or a bit of gardening, you'll earn some money that will enrich your life. So the person with a job should be financially better off than the person without a job. The student who studies for their exams should get a higher grade than the person who doesn't. And 99 times out of 100, that principle will always come true. And what we have in the book of Proverbs are common sense principles. They're not guarantees, they're principles that work. And if you want to change your situation, if you've got lazy hands, it's not going to change. You have to work at life. And if you put the effort in, you reap the reward. Now, if only the rest of the Bible was as simple as that verse, wouldn't life be easy? But the first one's a goodie because it's straightforward. Work brings a reward and laziness keeps you in poverty or makes you intellectually poor. Or you can apply it to all sorts of areas of life. So example number two. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city, but poverty is the ruin of the poor. Example number two, a fortified city. Now, before you left home to come to church today, I would imagine most of you, if not all of you, closed all the windows, locked all the doors, set the alarm. Now, there's always going to be someone sitting there thinking, did we close the bathroom window? Did I lock that door? You did. Just calm down, calm down. I remember mentioning that, did you put your chicken on once in the sermon? A lady got up and went out because she'd forgot to turn the oven on. <laughs> I just reminded her. So if you zoom off, we know where you're going. We, why do we lock the doors? Why do we put the alarm on? Why do we close the windows? Because we want security. We want a safe place to return to. Our space, our space. Well, in ancient times, it was slightly different. Security, safety, your safe place was within the city walls. There were small villages, small towns, small cities. The communities, like in our country 100 years ago, you could leave the back door open and not worry. Whereas today, sadly, you have to lock the back door, and we do worry. But in ancient times, within the city walls, you were safe. The gates were locked at night and guards were put on the top of the walls or on the watchtowers to keep the enemy out. That was your safe space. And this verse picks up on that illustration. The rich man's wealth is a strong city. They find protection and security within the city walls. And a rich man, in their own mind, finds protection and security within their wealth. How does that protect you? Well, for example, wealth allows you to live in a better neighbourhood. And when you come to insure your car, they want to know the postcode. And if you're in what they consider a poor neighbourhood, your, your insurance goes up. And if you're in a wealthy area, your insurance goes down. Because there's less crime in that area. You might be better off, uh, you might have a better security system for your home. Instead of just locking the doors and the windows, you might have an alarm that goes all the way to the police Station. Instant response because you can afford it, whereas a poor person can't. You might be able to afford private Medicare, so you're not on a waiting list for five years before you see a doctor. You can go next week to see a private doctor. You may be able to afford better food, a better quality of food. You can shop in Waitrose instead of Liddles. <laughs> I don't know what Liddles is like, it just came to my mind. Other supermarkets are poorer, I'm not sure. <laughs> So poorer people 
have to have the rough end of the deal. Wealthy people get a better lifestyle and they feel secure within that lifestyle. It is their fortified city. The trouble is they find comfort and security in their wealth and not in God. And if their wealth is stolen, if their shares crash overnight, if their car rusts on the driveway, you've got a problem. You've got a problem. Here's the third example. The blessing of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil for it. The blessing of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil for it. And the example of here is God blesses people. Now, sometimes you can inherit money. Sometimes a family member might die and leave you a large sum of money in a will. Sometimes you just strike gold. I've got a friend who started a computer business and it, it was very successful for a number of years. And then a big firm came along and offered him ridiculous money for his company. And he said, yes, please, and could retire overnight. Sometimes that happens. Wise people see when things like that happen, it's a blessing from the Lord. Foolish people say, no, 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 I've earned it. I'm a self-made man. I had to put the hours in. And, and, and the reason I'm rich, the reason I've got wealth, the reason I've got the lifestyle I've got is all my own efforts. The Bible calls that a foolish person. Wealth is a gift of God. Yet we may have to have worked hard for it, but it is still a blessing from God. I don't know if you've been taken up with uh, this over the last couple of nights, the aurora. Uh, photographs like this have been all over social media. And what, what a contrast of reactions. Again, I've got a, a number of friends who aren't Christians, and they've just been saying things like, wow, incredible sky tonight, amazing. And that's all they write. And then I know Christians have been saying, wow, amazing sky, the heavens declare the glory of God. What an almighty God we've got who can create this. And you've got two reactions. One just sees it as a natural uh, event, and others see the hand of God behind it. And when it comes to wealth and, in, and, and, our, our, and, and enjoying wealth, you can say, well, it's all of chance and luck and fortune or my hard work. Or you can say, actually, God has blessed me in my life. And one of the ways he's blessed me is with wealth. James says, every good, every perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. And wise is the person who realizes that all we have ultimately comes from God. I like the way the King James Bible uh, translates this verse. Um, it says this, The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. I like that little expression, he addeth no sorrow with it. Because some people get rich, and the sorrows come. And uh, there's been endless programs over the years of people who won the lottery. They became instantly rich, but the sorrow that came with it, as they suddenly discovered all these family members who wanted a share of the pie, all these people begging letters and, and, and saying, well, what about us? Marriages falling apart because they couldn't handle the wealth. It brought sorrow with it. But when God blesses, it doesn't bring sorrow. It adds to a person's life. It doesn't uh, creates uh, uh, pitfalls in a person's life. So that's the third example. God brings the blessing. Okay, example number four that Solomon brings. A person's riches may ransom their life, but the poor cannot respond to threatening rebukes. A person's riches may ransom their life, but the poor cannot respond to threatening rebukes. Now, this is going to be tough for me because I want to show you a little video clip of a footballer. But I don't like the team he plays for. So we won't mention his local team in the premiership. We'll mention his national team. He's a Colombian footballer called Luis Diaz who plays uh, for a certain team in the premiership. Um, but in November, his father was kidnapped in Colombia. And they said, you want to see your dad again? You pay the ransom. And this is a modern problem that footballers are facing. Because they're earning so much money, their life might be protected, but their families back home in their own countries aren't. 
And in Africa and in South America and in Asia, they are kidnapping parents or relatives of famous footballers and asking for huge demands. And that happened to Luis Diaz in November. And this is him being reunited with his family. So the example is, if you are rich, you can pay uh, a ransom for a relative or somebody you love. the ELN kidnapped 58-year-old uh, father of Luis Diaz and asked for a big ransom. But actually, the Colombian people were so outraged because here's one of their football heroes that the pressure of the people got them to release him for three. But he went through a 12-day ordeal. But that doesn't happen to most people. That's the Kaprinsky, the Kaprinsky family who had to uh, spend $4.5 million dollars to get their relative released. Ask the Greenies family, $5.1 million to get their relative released. The Piper family, 5.7 million. And that was a few years ago. Today it would have been 32 million pounds to release their loved ones. Wealth brings problems. But if you've got the money, you can afford to pay to get a person released. In contrast, the poor cannot respond to threatening rebukes. That's one problem you don't get, says Solomon. No one steals a poor person because they can't afford a ransom to release them. Okay, lesson number five. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it a wall too high to scale. They imagine it a wall too high to scale. Actually, this verse is best understood with the one before it. So although in our series it's been plucked out, you need to read verse 10 for contrast, which says this. The name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. The name of the Lord is a fortified tower. How many of you are singing that song in your head? That was popular a couple of years ago. The righteous run in and are safe. So there's a contrast, and the contrast is simple. Wise people find God to be their strong tower. They rest in his character and in his name. Wealthy people rest in their riches, as we saw earlier on. Wealthy people think, no one can climb up my wall. It's too big. It's too protected. I am safe. But the Lord and wise people know that they can. Cities get conquered. Walls get climbed. Wolf is not truly a strong city, and it's certainly not a high wall. It might keep some people out, but it won't keep everybody out. And therefore, when problems come, the wealthy don't have a true refuge. You'll know the, the monologue, the poem that says this. Money can buy a bed, but not sleep. Money can buy books, but not brains. Money can buy a clock, but not time. Money can buy food but not an appetite. Money can buy finery, but not beauty. Money can buy a house, but not a home. Money can buy medicine, but not health. Money can buy position, but not respect. Money can buy blood, but not life. Money can buy sex, but not love. Money can buy insurance, but not safety. Money can buy food, but not an appetite. Money can buy luxuries, but not culture. Money can buy amusements, but not happiness. Money can buy a cross, but not a saviour. Money can buy a, a passport to anywhere except for heaven. It promises so much, it can do so much, but actually it falls far short in so many areas. It is a wall that can be climbed. It is a city 
that can be conquered. So, says Solomon, don't put your hope in wealth, as if that's going to solve all your problems. Run to the Lord, whose name is a, uh, a strong tower, a fortified tower. His name is that, a name reveals someone's character. You know, if, if you said, do you know so-and-so, you don't just think of identity, you think of what sort of person that person is. And when God talks about his name, he's revealing his character. He is, hey, everlasting. He is uh, all-loving. He is uh, all the things we sang about in those songs earlier on and more. Totally faithful, totally dependent, totally a foundation for our lives and an anchor for the soul. Okay, lesson six. The poor plead for mercy, but the rich answer harshly. The poor plead for mercy, but the rich answer harshly. Yes, I know this from personal experience. <laughs> but this, this proverb actually isn't a command, and it's not an endorsement. It's not a command, it's not an endorsement. It simply reveals the truth of human nature. And we've all had people who have asked us for money and we blank them. We've been harsh towards them. We didn't, we didn't even acknowledge them. We just thought, no, you're just a beggar. I'm, you know, I don't know if it's genuine or not, so I'm just going to blank you. Or we say, no, thank you. And we can be harsh in our words towards somebody. So human nature tends to indulge the wealthy while being impatient with the poor. And when we see someone who's wealthy, we were very nice to them love your car beautiful car that one and, and we, we we kind of we're impressed by wealth but we despise the poor and like I say this isn't a command or an endorsement it just shows human nature see when someone is poor they've got no influence politicians don't want to know poor people they can't help them they might want their vote, but they go after the influential. They go after people with money because they want some of that money to support their causes. They want the influential to talk to their influential friends so that they can move up in circles. And they're not just rich or famous. They get a knighthood and they get this. Why? Because they're influenced and they're attracted by similar types. So this verse reveals the human heart. So maybe it's a kind of little example to us that maybe we should be a little bit kinder with those we come across. Example number seven. Wealth attracts many friends, but even the closest friend of the poor person deserts them. Wealth attracts many friends, but even the closest friend of the poor person deserts them. Someone said a rich man's wealth can attract people like ants are attracted to a picnic. Hey, if the sugar is there, if the food is there, the ants will come. And if you've got money, you'll have friends. They may be shallow friends, but you'll never be alone. You'll always have people at your side. But you remember the story of the prodigal son. When he left home with his money, he parted every night. He had plenty of friends. But when his money ran out, he found himself alone. Because they were just there for the party and the money. They didn't care about him. And one of the dangers of having wealth, and especially if you acquire wealth quickly is you never quite know who are genuine friends and who just want your money, who just want the good things. But the poor can also have problems with friendships because they've got nothing to keep people. It's quite easy to walk away from a poor person and get a new friendship that might influence or benefit you. So the book of Proverbs points out the negatives of friendships, but actually the last verse of the previous chapter points out some of the positives says, if you find a good friend, Proverbs 18, 24, they can stick closer than even a family member. So choose the right friends. Okay, lesson number eight. A fortune made by a lying tongue is a fleeping vapor and a deadly snare. A fortune made by a lying tongue is a fleeping vapor and a deadly snare. A lying tongue. How often do you get the phone call and you pick it up and they say, uh, excuse me, is that Mr. Curley? No, they normally say, is that Mr. Qualley? Or, well, they always pronounce my name wrong and I say, yeah. Uh, we're from Microsoft Windows. You've got a problem with your computer. And I say, have I? Yes, go and turn it on. Okay, I'll do that straight away. So I, I sit there and I say, yeah, what next? Put this in to your searcher. Okay, I've done it. 
Oh no, what do you see? Have you seen this? Yeah, I've seen it. Oh, you've got an infection. Oh no, what do I do? You need to give me some money. You've had calls like that. I get people sending me emails saying, we've got millions of pounds that we're looking to invest. If you send me your bank details, we'll give it to you. And you can be rich. (laughs) We've all seen stuff like that. On the telly, it's comical. When you've got a Dell boy or an Arthur Daly type character who's a bit of a Jack the Lad, a wheeler of a dealer, and they come along and they, and they, they, they make what seems to be a bargain, but you know it's, it's going to be a duffer. It's quite amusing when it happens to someone else. But we don't like it when it happens to us. And God says he hates a lying tongue. And if you make your fortune by a lying tongue, it's just a fleeping vapor. Why? Because this life is short. And when this life is over, we stand before God and we ask him why we deceive people and we con people and we lie to people. So some people hope to talk their way into money and they do it with a lying tongue. They make promises that aren't honest. It brings them a quick financial award, but when they die, it dies with them. And they live then in the light of of their actions. Ill-gotten gain is a fleeting pleasure, a snare, a trap. It promises riches, but it leads ultimately to judgment and to death. And then lastly, example, oh, that's that one, a lying tongue. Lastly, number nine, this one about bread. And this is what the guy says. Two things I ask of you, Lord. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. Example number nine, give me my daily bread. Actually, these verses are written by a different person. Solomon wrote the other Proverbs, but this chapter is written by a man called Agur, A-G-U-R. And he compiles these little verses, and um, he asks God for two things, and he wants them now. In verse 7, he says, don't wait till I die, give me them before I die. And what's the two things he asks for? Number one, verse 8, integrity. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. He wants to be a man of truth, not deception and lies. God is a God of truth, and this is a godly man. Therefore, he wants to mimic him and be a person of integrity. Integrity is better than wealth or poverty. Well, anything's better than poverty, we say. But actually, you are rich in your character. That is more important than being rich in your finances, as far as this uh, proverb is concerned. So his first request is for integrity. His second request is for contentment. Give me neither poverty or riches, but only my daily bread. And like I mentioned earlier, if you've got too much, you can push God to one side. Because life is comfortable. What do you need God for? And when life gets too bad, sometimes we do things to redeem the situation that aren't honest. Or we blame God for the situation. He says, Lord, I don't want to be like that, so give me contentment, meet my needs. A bit like Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. But you've got a problem with that, and so have I. We rephrase it, Lord, give us this day strawberries and ice cream. Give us this day salmon sandwiches. Give us this day cucumber sandwiches. Give us this day beef. Give us this, we want a whole load of stuff, but God promises daily bread. He meets our needs, not necessarily our greeds. And then in conclusion, remember what Jesus said. He didn't talk about wealth and poverty as something to be avoided or sought after. He said everyone should seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, get right with God, live for God, and all these things you need for life will be taken away. No, they'll be added, they'll be given. You don't have to seek after them. If you put his kingdom first and you live a righteous life, God will give you what you need for your daily life, according to this verse. That's the secret, to put God first. 
Let's pray. Lord, forgive us when we trust in our wealth. We know to many parts of the world we are extremely rich. Sometimes we look at others and we say, I'm very poor, but actually we are very, very wealthy. We have food in the fr fridge, in the freezers. We have clothes in the wardrobe. We have homes in which we live that are heated. We have hot running water as well as cold water. We have transportation. You have blessed us abundantly. Lord, we're thankful for all your goodness to us. Help us each one to put your kingdom first and to be content with what you give us day by day. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, musicians. We're going to sing one more song. And uh, if you're able to stay for tea and coffee, please join us. This is an old one. God of grace and God of glory, on your people pour your power. Crown your ancient church story. Bring its bud to glorious flower. Shall we stand? again now we got the tune they're good words let's sing them let's start again there sounded good I think we'll have that next week as well sounded good let's pray in fact let's do a benediction there's one on the screen let's say it together shall we after three one two three blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever amen please be seated our service is over enjoy your day but do stay for tea coffee before you rush off. Thank you.